Thank you, Martha, for uh, that kind introduction. Um, not admitting to praise UVA. And um, thank you for uh, coming to this lecture. Thanks to the uh, Classical and Eurostream Studies Department for inviting me to speak. Um, so we'll begin. The Greek historian Thucydides, reflecting on the revolution at Corsaira during the Peloponnesian War, comes to this famous and resonant conclusion. And I quote, In peace and prosperity, states and individuals have better sentiments because they do not find themselves suddenly confronted with imperious necessities. But war takes away the easy supply of daily wants and so proves a rough master that brings most men's characters to the level of their fortune. As Cicero wavered between favoring Pompey or Caesar in 50 BC, his young friend Caelius, whom you may know, already Caesarian, urged him to join the side of Caesar with Thucydidean reasoning. And this is the quote from Caelius. I do not think it escapes you that men in domestic discord ought to follow the more honorable side as long as the struggle is civil and without arms. But when it has come to war in the camp, they ought to follow the stronger and consider that better because it is safer. <clears throat> Cicero, of course, chose Pompey, and after uh, Caesar's death, chose to attack Antony viciously, hoping power, the power of the Senate might be restored. His head and hands, displayed on the rostra by the unforgiving Antony, testified to a bitter truth. Those who adhere too closely to fine and virtuous sentiments do not often survive civil war. And what of the survivors? Magnanimity and thanksgiving are the spoils of victory. So too, perhaps, blissful oblivion, if the victors are fortunate enough not to be haunted by the memory of the dead. As Brutus famously was, of course, uh, visited by an evil spirit, according to Plutarch and Shakespeare, with no message except, I shall see you at Philippi. Before the defeated, the blessings are naturally fewer. The joy of salvation must be weighed against both grief for dead comrades and accommodation to new masters. Perhaps it is not surprising, then, that such survivors may prefer the company of the dead, that they may take on the ghastly characteristics of those who visit them. To reduce a modern comparandum, William Faulkner's great novel, Absalom, Absalom, opens, and I quote, in a dim, hot, airless room, um, shuttered tight to keep out the heat, and for anyone who's spent a summer in the South, this is an unforgettable image. Um, Faulkner writes, uh, in, in this dim, coffin-smelling gloom, um, Miss Coldfield, dressed in black, relates to Quentin Compson, the fabulous story of Sutton. And this is not an unexpected event in the South, and this is how Faulkner describes it. In the Deep South, dead since 1865 and peopled with garrulous, outraged, baffled ghosts. Quentin's father summarizes this idea. Years ago, we in the South made our women into ladies. Then the war came and made the ladies into ghosts. In this world, civil war not only haunts the living, but makes them insubstantial and ghostly. Not, not yet dead, but altogether death-like. A strangely analogous fate awaits Roman political literature under the Principate, visible in ways large and small. On the level of literary genres, the vibrant and vital political culture of the late Republic with its lampoons, pamphlets, and speeches attacking the leading men of the day evolves first into attacks by proxy praise or blame of the heroic dead, like Cato, then into over, an overwhelming acceptance by the literati of the new order, Augustus's settlement. Survivors of the wars turn to literature not to advance or destroy the political careers of the aristocracy, but to commend the regime or to reflect on a glorious past, that is, when they are concerned with politics at all. The most acerbic critics of the Augustan settlement, the formidable and aloof Asinius Pollio, for example, withdrew entirely from public affairs. With 
the lifeblood of ambition drained away from Roman politics with panegyric displacing forensic oratory, the well-wrought genres of lyric, elegy, and laudatory epic overtaking bitter satire and harsh iambic, Roman political literature became a, a shadow of its former vibrant self. On the level of individual authors, Virgil and Propertius, both personally affected by the civil wars, come immediately to mind. Echoes of the loss and death of the wars may be heard in unexpected places. At the end of the first Georgic, which instructs the reader in the cultivation of crops, a book worth reading, of course, um, the poet paints an evocative picture of a farmer plowing the field of Philippi and unearthing rusted weapons and huge bones, the bones of heroes. And this is uh, Roman numeral 1A on your hand. Surely even that time will come when the farmer working the earth in those boundaries with his curved plow will come upon javelins consumed with foul rust or will strike empty helmets with a weighty harrow and he will marvel at the huge bones and graves exhumed. In the Aeneid, the great Augustan patriotic epic, the echoes, muted and confused, reverberate in the poet's dutiful but somber and world weary hero who makes his first appearance wishing to die. As Aeolus, provoked by Juno, unleashes a storm upon the Trojan ships, Aeneas cries out, and I quote, O oh, three and four times blessed are they, whom it befell to perish before the gaze of their parents under the high walls of Troy. Later, having journeyed to the underworld, he despairs that souls must return to bodies asking the spirit of his father Anchises why the dead would desire such a fate. And I quote again, O oh, father, must we think that some spirits go from here to the air above, and again are returned to slow bodies? Why do the wretched have such terrible desire for light? The poet Propertius, a native of Assisi in Umbria, whose ancestral land was confiscated by Octavian in the Prusine War, actually summons a ghost of this notorious and brutal conflict, a wounded soldier from the siege of Prusia, and this is Roman numeral 1A on your hand though. You who hasten to avoid your comrade's doom, soldier wounded from the Etruscan rampart, why do you turn your swollen eyes from my groaning? I am the closest to you of the army. On this condition, with you safe, may your parents be able to rejoice. Let your sister understand what happened here from, uh, sorry, just what happened from your tears. Thick gallus broke through the middle of Caesar's swords, but was not able to flee unknown hands. And whatever bones she will have found scattered over the Etruscan hillside, let her know these are mine. <clears throat> A common thread may be drawn through all of these remembrances. Civil war can hollow out its survivors, causing them consciously or unconsciously to renounce their vitality, to exchange their full-blooded life among the living for a pale and insubstantial existence among the dead. Virgil and Propertius lost their familial estates in the confiscations imposed by the triumvirs on the rest of Italy. Although Virgil's property was apparently restored, the guilt of this good fortune inspired one of his earliest poems, the evocative First Eclogue, which juxtaposes the fortunate Titerus with the dispossessed Melibius, whose property has been granted to a veteran. Propertius' father may have perished in the conflict. Even so, no contemporary author was more deeply and personally intertwined with the savage internecine conflicts of the last century BC than Horace, whose early life is scarcely separable from the spirit of discord. Venusia, Horace's birthplace, was the only Latin colony to take up the Italian cause against Rome during the Social War some 25 years before the poet's birth. Retaken by a Roman army, the rebellious Venusians suffered as the Italians did. Their land was confiscated and redistributed to Saul's veterans, and they themselves were executed or enslaved. Horace's own father was briefly or symbolically enslaved. The young poet's early schoolmates, whom he refers to derisively as the great sons of great centurions, were likely descendants of resettled veterans. 
The disaffection was apparently mutual. Horace's unwelcome companions no doubt mocked him as the son of a freedman, an insult that the successful poet would later wear as a badge of pride. The wound was more to pride and honor than to material circumstances. Horace's father soon recovered his wealth, attaining Roman citizenship and probably equestrian status. But the episode il illustrates vividly how, in Roman society, the scars of civil war may be inherited by children and grandchildren. Horace's father financed for his son the best possible education, training in rhetoric at Rome, followed by a course in philosophy at Athens. Doesn't that sound nice? Here, an unlikely figure in self-imposed exile from Rome shared Horace's seminars and recitations, Marcus Junius Brutus, one of Caesar's assassins. How could Horace and the other young men studying there have failed to admire the Tyrannicide's active and fearless devotion to virtue, now veiled by his modest love of learning and wisdom? The philosophical repose was a guise and an illusion. All the while, Brutus was preparing for war against the Caesareans. Horace was swept along. More than that, Horace was commissioned as an officer in Brutus's army, a military tribune, maybe, even if we take his word for it, given at some point command of a legion, a rare honor for a junior officer. Sign of a family shamed in defeat by a Roman general, Horace now led Roman soldiers into war. Suddenly proud and convinced that he was on the virtuous side, we can imagine him on the eve of Philippi in early October 42 BC, calm and decided, as Syme says of Brutus himself. The scale of the conflict of Philippi was immense. 200,000 legionaries, plus numerous auxiliaries, easily twice the size of Mutino or Pharsalus. The Liberatores had good reason for optimism a strong position, ample supplies, and naval superiority in the Aegean. Nonetheless, it was to be the Republic's last stand. Antony, with some help from Octavian, inflicted a crushing and total defeat. Cassius, then Brutus, committed suicide. Among the tens of thousands dead were many sons of the noblest families of Rome. And in sign, I'm quoting sign here, no battle of the civil wars was more murderous to the aristocracy. Horace, who had expected better, returned to Italy, where his property had been confiscated, humbler and poorer than ever. Born into a dispossessed family, a veteran of the most horrific of all battles which the Romans fought against each other, defeated and dispossessed of his own property, we would not be surprised to find Horace after Philippi a haunted and broken man, or to quote Faulkner, a garrulous, outraged, baffled ghost. Yet quite the opposite is true. He does not write explicitly about his own experience at Philippi until some 20 years after the event, in Odes 2 7. And it, here his treatment is lighthearted and cavalier. He does not solemnly invoke any famous Republican or adopt the persona of a dead soldier, as Propertius does. The poem is addressed to the unidentifiable and probably invented Pompeius, happily returned to Rome. As for the battle itself, Horace writes of losing a shield and having been whisked out of danger by Mercury, transparent allusions to Archilochus and Homer, which cloud the poem's historical significance. It is a frustrating and seemingly frivolous poetical exercise. And I quote uh, the two eminent British commentators on Horace, Nisbet and Hubbard. This astute and realistic man who had lived through such remarkable events cannot comment on them with intelligence. Horace, of course, recovered his fortune by reconciling with the victorious Octavian. Would it not have been indiscreet to dwell upon the terrible cost of his benefactor's victory? at Philippi, perhaps, but understandable and hardly offensive, Propertius's poems about Perugia, the blackest episode in Octavian's career, did not apparently damage his prospects for attaining Mycen the patronage of Mycenaeus, um, Octavian's deputy. Augustus himself both admired those who remained below to the memory of Brutus and appointed unrepentant republicans to government posts. Or was Horace simply too genial, too moderate, 
with such brave and fiery thoughts, content merely to enjoy his comfortable pleasures without reflection or passion. So Nisbet and Hubbard assert, and also their Victorian forebears. But this is, in my view, a superficial and fundamentally unfair reading of the Odes. Horace, like his idol Pindar, writes for those who understand subtlety and indirection. And when he grapples with the ghosts of Philippi, he addresses, he addresses himself to the, to the living, not the dead. There are at least six odes in the first collection, that's books one through three, addressed to survivors of the civil wars who at some point fought on the losing side. In the next portion of my talk, I will focus on three. One four addressed to Lucius Cestius, one seven addressed to Lucius Eunatius Plancus, and two three addressed to Quintus Delius. All of these men were versatile characters who successfully protected their wealth and status in a time of turmoil, and each poem locates its addressee in the context of a symposium at the conjunction of pleasure and death. And now I turn to Odes one four, which is hand up. Roman numeral two there at the bottom of the first page. <coughs> Odes 1 4 confronts the reader with a daring and almost unparalleled experiment in the use of address. The first three stanzas of the poem are neatly divided from the final two. Harsh winter is thawed by the welcome change of spring, and the west winds and winches drag down, drag down dry keels, nor are the cattle rejoicing any longer in their stables nor the plowman by his fire, nor are the meadows bright with white frost. Already Venus of Kithra leads the dancing while the moon hangs overhead and the comely graces joined by the nymphs shake the earth with one foot after the other, while fiery Vulcan goes to inspect the oppressive workshops of the Cyclopes. Now is the time to bind glistening hair with green myrtle or flowers which the thawed earth bears. Now is the time to sacrifice the shady groves with harness a lamb if he should ask for it, a goat if he, if he prefers. The poem opens at a distinct moment, winter turning into spring. In these first three stanzas, there is no suggestion of address. For whom is it time to make preparations for celebration? It could be the speaker, the reader, or anyone else. When the addressee is introduced in the fourth stanza, in an unexpected change of tone, springs reawakening of life is cut short. And this is what shocked the Horace class last week when we did this poem. The pale death kicks equally at the shacks of the poor and the castles of kings. O oh, blessed Cestius, life's brief extent forbids us to set out on distant hopes. Soon night will press around you in the legendary shades in the barren house of Pluto. Once you have traveled there, Neither will you roll for kingdoms of wine with dice, nor marvel at young Lycidas, for whom all the youth now burn, for whom the, girl, the girls will soon grow warm. Scholars over the past hundred years have occupied themselves by demonstrating how the two halves of the poem cohere. But there is no question that Cestius, whose introduction accompanies the startling change of direction, is the hinge on which the poem turns. On the one hand, the speaker, as he addresses Cestius, situates the initial meditation on the arrival of spring in the context of a symposium, switching from an inclusive we, notes of line 15, to the exclusive second person, you, line 16, 17, 18, 19, so as to focus on the addressee. The private indoor pleasures of dice, drinking, and boys are those pleasures that Cestius cannot hope will last forever. And the natural beauty of spring is merely the impetus for darker thoughts. We, sorry, the natural beauty of spring, merely the impetus for darker thoughts, retreats into the background. This context perversely reorients, reorients the sentiments of the opening lines. Spring may be welcome to cattle and plowmen, but the symposiast greets it bitterly. It's a grim realization that this overwhelming force of life will bring an end to both his symposium and to his time on earth. In fact, the wording of the, three, the first three stanzas is suitably amb ambiguous. The statement that cattle no longer take pleasure in their stables requires a new meaning when it is echoed by the image of death knocking on doors. These two images, from 
one perspective strictly opposed, are united by the idea of an irresistible natural force bringing an end to time comfortably spent inside. This apparent pessimism also serves the purpose of inciting the symposiast to enjoy what time he has left, to pour more wine for his companions. But if such a request is indeed intended, it, like the symposium itself, is left implicit. If the poem only expressed this revelation, the cruelty of spring as it stirs life from slumber, as it mixes memory with desire, so to speak, or if it only contrasted the cycle of the seasons with the linear progression of human life, it would remain fascinating, to be sure, but probably uncontroversial. Just as challenging as the swift transition, however, is the identity of the addressee. In a poem so calculated to shock, it would be illogical to ignore Cestius' presence here, or to assume, as Nisbet and Hubbard do, that he plays an insignificant role in the poem. In fact, the choice of Cestius is both suggestive and puzzling. The ancient commentator Porfirio identifies him tersely as Lucius Cestius, Consularis, compressing a remarkable story into a single word. Cestius was the scion of a distinguished Republican family. His father Publius married a descendant of Scipio Asagonus, Asiagonus and served as quaestor, tribune, praetor, and proconsul. Publius Cestius was an associate of Cicero. He fought against Catiline in 63 and worked as tribune to effect Cicero's recall from exile in 58 and 57 during which effort he sustained wounds at the hands of partisans of Clodius. The younger Cestius first appears, this is Lucius Cestius of the poem, as a pride textatus at his father's trial for political violence in 56, where the defense speeches were given by an opposing cadre of powerful men, Crassus, Hortensius, Calvus, and Cicero himself. The younger Cestius joined the army of the Liberatores in 44, during which time Horace may have made his acquaintance. For his refusal to betray Brutus, he was proscribed, but later pardoned. Augustus, in a gesture of magnanimity, appointed him consul suffectus on July 1st, 23 BC, when the emperor, seriously ill, resigned after eight consecutive terms as consul. The Cesti were known not only for their politics, but also for their fabulous wealth. Catullus and Cicero speak of Publius Cestius as a man of means and a consummate entertainer, and the younger Cestius may have amassed an even greater fortune through the manufacture of amphora and bricks. Certain aspects of the poem may allude to the Adversi's industry and riches, but the political connection has proven the most difficult to understand. Why should a poem addressed to an unrepentant part partisan of Brutus, published in the year of the former's consulship and con concomitant reconciliation with the Augustan regime, come so soon after a prayer addressed to Caesar's Avenger, and that's the previous poem, or two poems before, poem one, two. Can this juxtap juxtaposition be coincidental? On this puzzling issue, there is much speculation and little agreement. The questions are manifold. Why would a man like Cestius, who resolutely faced death for his steadfast loyalty to Brutus, now stand in need, on the very point of his final reconciliation with the victor, of advice about the brevity of life? Does it not do Cestius a disservice to suggest, even as he is honored by Augustus for his courage and ideals with the highest office of the state, that what he values most in life is drinking and pederasty. In this context, it is surely significant that the symposium itself is illustrated only by the contemplation of its future loss. There are no clear dictative markers of the event, and the customary request to enjoy the moment is, as has been noted, never stated. The poet is discreet. He does not actually say that Cestius enjoys the febrile pleasures of the symposium, to quote Nisbet and Hubbard, or even that he should. He merely points out that such pleasures will not be available in the afterlife, and allows the reader to understand the implications. Likewise, the adversary's happiness, whether it's ultimate causes, wealth, virtue, or political good fortune,
fortune is measured only by the fact that he needs to be reminded about the inevitability <coughs> of death. Even you will die, Cestius, blessed as you are, says the speaker. A man who contemplates escaping death must be blessed indeed. But blessed in what way? The reader can only speculate. The fact is that the choice of Cestius as an addressee is every bit as surprising as the unusual delay of address and the startling transition from burgeoning spring to imminent death. Once again, the poem proceeds by opposition. The first stirring of spring, to some a welcome change, becomes for the speaker a reason to view the future with dark suspicion. The reader is then asked to accept the idea that for the symposiast, and perhaps by implication for others, spring and death go together. Yet even as this unlikely equation is being resolved through the intimation of the symposiac occasion, Cestius sets, sets the poem moving in a different direction. This is no ordinary symposium. The speaker summons a rich and eminent man, born into civil discord and raised in the very jaws of civil war, but fortunate beyond reason, a survivor, like the poet, of the losing side, and one who maintained a reputation outstanding or symbolic enough to secure from his former opponent an appointment to the consulship. The poet chooses Cestius precisely because he is so beatus, so blessed, not just financially, but now but also morally, and now politically. Yet here he is brought back to earth, reminded of corporeal pleasures and admonished that they are fleeting. For consular powers and commercial empires, sovereignty over the drinking substitutes, won by a game of chance, and passing as quickly as the last cup of wine. <coughs> to call Cestius into the symposium is to cast all the great exertions of his life as just another roll of the dice, no more worthy of memory or regret than the pleasures of the flesh. And even this lesser occasion is not fixed with certainty, but rather lamented as already fading into the past. In the same way, a fortiori, all of Cestius's blessings are already slipping away, even as he arguments them. We shall see a very similar complex of ideas at play in Odes 1 7, which I will turn to presently. And this is uh, the next poem on your handout, Roman numeral 3. <clears throat> Judging from the volume of its exegesis, Odes 1 7 is one of Horace's most difficult poems. The considerable scholarly energy expended on this poem has been spent, as with Odes 1 4, on the question of unity. The question of what relation the poem's three parts bear to each other. The poem begins with a pretty note. Um, and I've marked this on your handout in brackets, as you can see. Others will praise famous roads of Mytilene or Ephesus or the walls of Corinth between two seas or Thebes well known for Bacchus or Delphi for Apollo or for Th or Thessalian Tempe. There are those whose sole duty is to celebrate the city of Athena the Virgin in endless song to affix on their brow the olive plucked from anywhere. Those are the Hellenists in the room here. Um, many a one in honor of Juno will tell of Argos fit for horses and rich Mycenae. As expected of a preamel, the speaker opposes himself to these others, the Ali of the first line. Neither hardy Sparta nor the fields of, fields of rich Larissa have struck me as much as the house of resounding Albunia and the headlong Anio and the grove of Tiburnus and the orchards watered by one channel after another. <coughs> The transition from these introductory stanzas to the central paranesis, or advice, of the poem is perhaps even more abrupt than the transition in Odes 1-4 from spring to death. And as in Odes 1-4, it accompanies the introduction of the address seed. Just as a clearing south wind often wipes away clouds from a dark sky and does not bring forth rain forever, so too remember you are wise to limit sadness in the struggles of life with mellow wine, Plancus. Whether the camp gleaming with standards holds you, or the dense shadows of your tipper will hold you. In midline, the myth of Teucer is introduced, and with this exemplum, 
the poem concludes. They say that Tusser, when he was fleeing Salamis and his father, nevertheless bound his temples wet with wine with a poplar crown, addressing his unhappy friends thus, Wherever fortune kinder than my father will take us, there we will go, O comrades and compatriots. No need to despair with Teucer as your commander and under the auspices of Teucer. For unerring Apollo promised that there would be a second Salamis in a new land. <clears throat> o brave men who have often suffered worse with me, now drive away your sorrows with wine. Tomorrow we will traverse again the huge sea. The, un the uneasy conjunction, or outright disjunction, of these three pieces, Priamel, Parinesis, and Exemplum, must be among the oldest controversies in the history of Horatian scholarship. Complicating the question is the exceptional political career of the adversary, Lucius Minatius Plancus, legate of Caesar in Gaul in the civil wars, founder of Lyon, correspondent of Cicero, consul in 42 BC, partisan of both Antony and Octavian, and finally, in 22 BC, censor. Plancus's most remarkable talent was his ability to survive. Of all of Caesar's legates in the Gallic Wars, Plancus alone managed to keep both his life and a modicum of political influence through Actium into the Principate. This talent earned him the opprobrium of the historian Peleus Patericolus, among others. We need not suppose that Horace shared the historian's opinion, but surely he had the full scope of this remarkable life in view when he published the collection in 23 BC, and perhaps he even knew of Plancus' upcoming censorship in 22 BC. It is natural to expect that this relative abundance of biographical facts can help explain and unify Odes 1 7. And once again, the ancient commentator Porfirio was the first to pursue this line of argument <coughs> when he suggested that Plancus was born in Tibur. Plancus' long military career meant, among other things, that he was abroad from 41 to 32 BC. This extended absence from home has been linked to the focalization of Tibur in the Priamon. Um, I should mention briefly that uh, the, the, the cities, the Greek cities in the start of the Priamon, um, lead up to these places in Tibur at the end of the Priamon. So it's building up to this mention of Tibor, which is where Horace lives, incidentally. <clears throat> That's the focalization. Um, this extended absence from home has been linked to the focalization of Tibor and Priamel, the tristitium ritae que laboris of line 18, the sadness and labors of life, and the mythical exile of Tusser. The death of Plancus's brother in the prescriptions of 43 BC should have been, if indeed the prescription was forced upon Plancus rather than, as some think, sought by him, should have been his greatest sadness. This offers another apparent parallel with the story of Teucer, whose exile arose from his father Telamon's unjust accusation that Teucer was responsible for his brother Ajax's death at Troy. These parallels are tempting, that they create as many problems as they solve. First of all, some scholars find it incredible that Horace would be so tactless as to allude, even cryptically or sympathetically, to an episode as potentially painful as the prescription of Lucius Clodius Plancus. Why should the poet want to revisit this unfortunate death, to remind Plancus of, of the prescriptions, to reopen wounds now some 20 years old, and if tristitium vitae que laboris, the sadness and labors of life, refers rather to Plancus's decade of service abroad, where is he now? This question, the nature of the dramatic occasion, has historically been the most difficult aspect of the poem to understand. The meanings of lines 19 and 21 are at the center of this controversy. These lines have been interpreted in three principal ways. The first, um, maybe I just direct you to these lines. This is uh, um, the third stanza from the bottom. Um, Whether the camp gleaming with standards holds you or the dense shadows of Tibur will hold you. 
The first, and perhaps most obvious interpretation, understands the lines to say that Plancus is now, at the dramatic day of the poem, abroad, or on his way back to Tibur. This makes for a nice analogy <coughs> with Husser's situation in the mythological exemplum, since he too has a perilous journey to undergo. Various dates have been proposed for when Plancus could have found himself in such a situation. Yet, disjunction remains. Praise of Tibor as a beauty spot ought to give way to praise of the consolation that homecoming can bring. Or praise of Plancus's endurance is Odyssean nostalgia. But praise of this kind is conspicuously not forthcoming. Instead, Plancus is advised that consolation will come from meditation on the nature of change or more importantly, from wine, available anywhere and to anyone who is wise. Furthermore, fixing an early dramatic date renders the dramatic setting uncertain. The speaker admonishes Plankus to drink, but at a symposium that the speaker himself can only imagine, or he, he himself will be absent. Conversely, a significant minority of scholars have argued that Plankus is in Tibet, and thus in speaker's presence. This provides a sensible connection between the pre and all of lines 1 through 14 and the parenthesis or advice of 15 through 21, but now the future tense of Tenebit will hold becomes problematic, as well as the point of castra tenent, the camp holds, and the meaning of the myth of Tusu. Tenebit could perhaps be explained following Quinn as will not let you go. But is it really plausible that Plancus, now a man in his 60s, the very symbol of opportunism and time serving, having alone among all his cobalts and against all odds survived the civil wars more or less unscathed, is it really plausible that such a man is now contemplating in the shade of his beloved Tibur another command and new adventures abroad? So I'm surely right that there's no chance of the third reading, a synthesis of the first two, is practically their equal in antiquity. This interpretation contends that the very question of dramatic setting, the question of where is Plancus, misconstrues the point. The story of Teucer surprisingly provides the impetus. For in a lost tragedy of Pacubius, which Cicero quotes, Teucer declares, Patria est ubicumque bene est. One's fatherland is wherever all is well. This, so the argument goes, is the central message of the poem. Home and the symposium are nowhere and everywhere, being both only states of mind. The real message is thus, wine offers happiness wherever you are. As a solution to a seemingly intractable, intractable problem, this argument is immediately attractive. But it is misleading to take the Cubius' maxim at face value and map it directly onto the poem. The philosophical current here runs deeper. For one, the Priamo, as we've seen, culminates in a specific geographical place, Tibur. It is a shock to discover in lines 20 and 21 that the homecoming, Plancus's homecoming, will be put off into the future. Abroad is not treated as home's equivalent, but rather as an opposing principle by which the value of home may be illustrated. Thus the speaker begins by reflecting on homecoming, but thoughts, thoughts quickly turn to what kept Plancus away, sorrow, struggles, to camp, and the long journey back to Tibur. At the critical center of the poem, the south wind is introduced as a metaphor for change, and the emphasis given to the wind's beneficence ought not obscure the implication of this image. Constant change, constant movement, constant transformation. Just as the Priamel draws attention to Tibor by the enumeration of foreign places as foils, so too is homecoming illustrated only by the contemplation of exile and sadness. Clear skies by the thought of storms. The admonition to drink also implies its opposite, namely irremediable, irremediable sorrows that must be quelled. The synthesis of home and abroad is thus imperfect and pessimistic. If wine and courage can make being abroad seem, temporarily, more like being at home, so too can a life of wandering render home a foreign place. 
Thus the speaker does not just advise and celebrate the mental fortitude of a man who is at home everywhere. He also laments the fate of a man who, in a world transformed, cannot go home again. Even, in the even as the shadows of Tibor embrace him, Plancus will have sorrows to quench with wine. And by imposing sorrow on this most fortunate of all imminent civil warriors, the poet once again suggests, with the utmost subtlety, that the life of peace is for Plancus and others like him unrecoverable. Okay, I'll turn now to the last poem, Roman numeral three on the end. Oh, sorry, Roman numeral four on the end. Odes two three, as one seven divides neatly into three parts. It opens with a stern admonition. Remember to stay even-minded in hard times, that's good advice. And not otherwise in good times, keep your mind moderated from excessive happiness, delius destined to die. Whether you will have lived in sorrow your whole life, or whether you cheer yourself reclining in a secluded meadow days of festivals with a rather fine Falernian vintage. The speaker, picking up on the symphonic theme of line 7 and 8, now asks Delius to, to call for wine. Why do the pine and the white poplar love to allow their branches in hospitable shade? Why does the fleeing water struggle and tremble in a meandering stream? Order someone to bring wine here, an unguent, in the all too brief flowers of the lovely rose, while fares and age in the dark thread of the three sisters allow it. The reader might initially mistake the description of the trees and the stream for a general statement about nature. After all, the speaker frames the description as a question and does not ask the addressee to observe these phenomena directly, as he does elsewhere. The imperative Yube however, in the date to Kuk, to hear, seem to offer an answer and to set a dramatic scene. The shade and the water exist to provide an occasion for a symposium. But now the dark thoughts of the opening stanza return. You will depart from your purchased groves and your house and your estate, which the yellow tiber washes. You will depart, and your heir will possess your wealth piled up high. Whether born rich from the time of antique Inachus, or poor and from the lowest race under God, there is no difference. You will die, a victim of Orcus who has no pity. We are all gathered to the same place. From the urn is shaken, sooner or later, everyone's lot, soon to come out and to put us on the boat for eternal exile. This poem, like 1-4 and 1-7, lends itself to speculation. Perhaps, critics assert, Delius is ill, or has struggled to enjoy his prosperity. <coughs> what we know of the historical man, however, points in a different direction. Quintus Delius had a long and eventful career through the years of the Civil War, which saw him, like Plancus, chain sides multiple times, serving under Dalbella, Cassius, Antony, and Octavian in turn, surviving Philippi and deserting Antony just before his defeat at Actium. He was a talented diplomat, a historian, and apparently a lover of pleasure with sometimes scandalous tastes. Such a versatile character would scarcely have needed help maintaining his equanimity in hard times, nor would this talented and energetic circus rider of civil war have had very many obvious reasons for melancholy in 23 BC, no more than Cestius or Plancus. In fact, Delius, as the poem admits, knows how to enjoy himself. Therefore, an urgent admonition to enjoy what remains of life hardly seems opposite. But it is not Delius's lethargy or melancholy that offends the poet. It is rather his excessive happiness, his shameless ostentation, his lack of perspective. The epithet, moratore, you will die, about to die, properly understood, makes this point in a bitter and direct way. Even now, Delius, as you relax happily with your favorite wine, death hangs over you, and don't you forget it. 
Nor does the speaker miss a chance to point out the vanity of Delius as well. His groves are newly acquired, and his villa overlooks the Tiber, the very definition for chorus of pointless luxury, to which the rustic and impromptu celebration proposed by the speaker of the poem is in stark contrast. Death, as in one four, becomes the final equalizer of class, rich or poor, noble or wretched, we all die. More than that, we live and die by the same odds. We all pass by the same journey to the same afterlife. There is no institution more brutally democratic than the jaws of Orcus, who pities no one. The symposium in, in 2-3, proposed but not enacted, is, as in 1-4 and 1-7, a convenient fiction. What we know to be true in the case of Plancus, we strongly suspect in that of Cestius and Delius. The poet does not, in these poems, address intimate friends. The ambiguity of dramatic setting points in the same direction. The discrete hints and suggestions of 1-4, the geographical uncertainty of 1-7, and the contrasting tastes of speaker and addressee in 2-3, all alike in part an air of steady vagueness to the dramatic situation, with the particulars left up to the imagination of the reader. The artificial nature of these interactions is easy for the reader unfamiliar with the poet's social milieu to miss. The Greek symposium, unlike the Roman convivium, Facil facilitated the temporary disillusion of class boundaries. The conventions of sympathetic discourse thus allowed a speaker of these poems to arrogate to himself the position of social and intellectual equal, to advise freely two extraordinarily successful men of consular standing, and the third who had moved comfortably in dangerous times among both Roman dynasts and Eastern potentates. Horace's own conventional attainments, though certainly not inconsiderable, are modest by comparison. And he is not, though it might superficially seem so, advising disconsolate or haunted souls to take some small pleasure from the moment. He is rather, he is rather wrenching the mighty from their lofty seats, imposing melancholy upon them, forcing them to face the bitter truth that even the most modest of their pleasures will soon dissipate in death. Why should he do so if he did not find these fellow survivors too self-satisfied, too alive? Perhaps we could apply the same logic to the frivolous, so-called frivolous, oh, it's 2-7. Horace fails his own service at Philippi, an illusion, an understatement, because he could not bear to face it directly. To conclude, Horace's family tree and his memories are peopled with the ghosts of civil war. But it is not his nature to brood openly. He haunts not the dim, airless room of Balthus's cold field, but a quiet corner, a walled garden, a small measure of time, fortifying himself with strong but modest wine, clinging to the day's meager pleasures. His imperfect epicureanism, if not learned at Philippi, was reinforced there. Before he died, Brutus is said to have quoted a saying of Heracles from a lost group tragedy. And I quote, O oh, wretched virtue, truly you were just a word when I thought you a fact, but you were a slave to fortune. Horace reiterates this idea in passing in Odes 2.7. At Philippi, virtue was broken. The strong perished. Survival rested upon the merest chance. Plancus, Cestius, and Delius all survived by the grace of inconstant fortune. But even the most fortunate will not escape death. This final, irrevocable truth offers a consolation to virtuous sufferers. Those unworthy of their material prosperity will someday, sooner than they think, be brought down to the level of ordinary men. More than that, their material pleasures are already slowly and perceptibly slipping from their grasp. They are already assuming the aspect of ghosts, even if they refuse to accept it. This is the dark twin of Carpe Diem, a bitter, cynical view 
a renunciation of the honors life can bestow, but thoroughly the fitting one whose wings were clipped and whose spirit was broken in 42 BC in the consulship of Plancus. Thank you. <laughs>